is Cheryl Crasher, and I'm going to introduce somebody who's going to introduce your keynote speaker. Um, we have a very special person here with us this year who's here every single year, and it wouldn't be Nerfa without Jean Shea, our beloved folk DJ from WXPN in Philadelphia. So I'm going to introduce Jean, and I'm going to have Jean introduce Christine. And if you guys want to move up, there's plenty of wonderful chairs here to listen to the keynote speech. So enjoy the festivities for the rest of the evening. Jean Shea, everybody. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you so much. You know, it's great to be back here. I missed a couple of these uh, great affairs and missed seeing my old pals. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to one of my pals right now. A wonderful lady who has done so much for me and for music. And just to give you an example of the kind of friend she is, when when uh, Nancy, who was it now? When uh, Julie Gold, her friend in New York, wrote a song called From a Distance. You remember that? Yeah. Uh, didn't she suggest, I think she did, said, Julie, put that on six different cassettes. Just make six cassette versions of that. I'd like to give those to different friends and get somebody really good to do your song. Well, that worked out pretty well, I must say, because eventually Bette Midler recorded that. It became a million seller and, uh, man, and also one of the most recorded albums, uh, songs rather, in, in the world. My goodness. And that was just friendship. She also came a number of times to my anniversary concerts, my farewell concerts, and. She even helped me one time try to get uh, my show or some kind of show on, on TV because she knows all about how to merchandise yourself and how to get yourself out there in the world so there can people to see what you do and hear what you do and the song is that you write. So without anything further, let's give her, uh, I don't think she has any flaming batons to throw at the audience. So you can take that... Um, those blankets, you know, off of your the front your seats and your front lap, and let us welcome to uh, Nerfa Christine Latin. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here, and uh, just to get it out of the way, people always ask, how did you get into folk music? I watched lessons on public television when I was 12 years old, Laura Weber, and that's how I learned how to play. I started writing songs when I was 13, and I changed my major seven times when I was in college. The only thing I did consistently was play guitar and write songs, and I ended up in 1975 as a waitress and bread baker at the Cafe Lena in Saratoga Springs, where I learned so much and saw so many great performers, including Dave Van Ronk, who encouraged me to come to New York. So, that's how I got started. Now, right now, I'm 64 years old. I did not quit my day job until I was 32. So I spent the first half of my life so far not supporting myself as a folk singer, but the past half doing just that. I've made 22 solo albums and 10 compilations showcasing dozens of songwriters whose work that I love. Now, what I plan to do is give you the best advice that I've heard over the last 32 years as a performer, that I hope it can help you. And one of the best things I ever heard was from Dave Van Ronk. He said, when music of quality sells, it's good for all of us. Never root against your competitor if what they are doing is good music, because if they get more work, you will get more work. And I've lived by those words. I love this Woody Guthrie quote. I heard this one secondhand, of course. Woody Guthrie said, the job of the folk singer is to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. That one phrase can get you out of a lot of hot jams, I'm telling you. Pete Seeger said, if you want to be a folk singer, you sing anywhere for any amount of time, for any amount of money, whenever you are asked. And uh, we've all been through that, but that's also good advice. Livingston Taylor, he has a very simpler idea. He said, your job as a folk singer is to make people feel better. That's all. Think about it. People come out, they, they want to feel some kind of uplift. They want to be transported. They want to feel better. And that's a very simple concept, but you can spend your whole life trying to perfect that. One of the things that Tom Paxton taught me 
This is very important because all of us as songwriters, we freak out when we stop writing songs for whatever reason. And he said, if your well runs dry and you aren't writing, recognize that as a time you are filling up the tanks. It's normal, it's natural, you haven't lost your gift, don't panic. And I find that to be very good advice. And the smartest thing that I've ever learned from Tom, I'll show you the one thing you can do that can break the spell that you've been weaving the whole night of a performance. One simple thing you do can ruin it all. And this is it. <laughs> Never, ever look at your watch like that on stage. What he says to do is wear your watch on your left hand if you're playing right-handed guitar so that as you're playing, you can keep track of it. And I've seen people who do that, but then they'll go and look at their watch like this. And it's still very obvious. And it just ruins the spell. So if you learn nothing else from this little speech, wear your watch like that, never go like that. Unless you're trying to like totally lose the audience. Some people do that. Um, Mark Dan is here. I love Mark Dan, I've been working with him for decades. He's got a great quote. You know what he said to me one time? He goes, the way I figure it, all you have to do is be more interesting than the person the audience member came with. <laughs> right. Because otherwise, they'll talk to their friend. But you, we know in folk music, we really draw a smart crowd. So the bar is higher than it would be at, you know, like a Trump rally or something. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, boo. OK. One of my best friends in the business is Alan Pepper. He owned the bottom line for 30 years. And he taught me so much. He said, never promote something you have to make excuses for. This is before Fast Folk, before Four Pigeon Babes, Winter's Night, anything. I had proposed a show that was me with three other performers. He pointed at one of the names and he said, what do you think of her music? And the truth is, I didn't like it, but I knew she could sell some tickets. So that's what I said. It's not my cup of tea, but I know she could sell about 100 tickets. And he said, no, no. You never promote something you have to make excuses for. I would never put her on my stage. And when you came and brought this to my attention, if you said you liked her, the meeting would have been over. He said, no, that's not going to work here. He said, you know what I would like to do? I would love to do something with that guy, Jack Hardy, and the fast folk people. So if you know them, tell them. So it actually came out that the fast folk did shows at the bottom line for years, all because I proposed a bad show, but and uh, <laughs> somebody he didn't like. <laughs> But one of the things that Alan also gives advice, he says uh, he never ever in 30 years had the same headliner with the same opening act. He said, you will have people who come back year after year after year, and they may hear the same songs from the headliner who they love, and if they're going to see the same opening act, it's not spreading the wealth, it's not giving them a really different show. So he kept track. He would never have the same two together, which I think is very good advice. And he also liked snappy titles. When I came to him a couple years later, it was, uh, I had done a record called On a Winter's Night, Cliff Eberhardt's on it, some other people, and uh, it was going to be Sally Fingerette, Megan McDonough, and me in the summertime, but not a winter show. And he said, add a fourth name to it and give it a snappy title, and then I might book it. So I said, well, who should I get? And he looked at the list of all the people in On a Winter's Night, and he said, Patty Larkin. So it was Patty Larkin, Meg McDonough, Sally Fingeret, and me. And Sally came up with, buy me, bring me, take me, don't mess my hair, life according to four bitchin' babes, which means nothing except it's going to be a fun show. And he booked us at the bottom line, and we started touring. And tonight, they are in Port Angeles in Washington State. The babes are still going. I was in the group for eight years. And when it didn't, wasn't a good fit for me anymore, I stepped aside, and Camille West took my place. And I think it's great to create projects that can have sort of a loosely flowing, ever-changing cast of characters. And because the, the economy sucks, it still does. And people might not come out to see a single performer, but they will come out to see four performers for the price of one. Rich Warren is here, and I asked him, I said, what's the best advice you would give to people about CDs? And he said, don't create a CD until you're absolutely certain the quality of your songs and performances is ready for radio. When interacting with radio DJs, be polite as well as sincere and enthusiastic about your work. And one thing I would like to add, I, I think there are some DJs here. Would you prefer it if folk singers unwrapped their CDs before sending them to you? Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> unwrap them. Because I know when I get to do guest DJ things, I always play the unwrapped ones first. So, oh, this is one of my favorite quotes. I live in New York. I, there's so many different kinds of music that influences me. Stephen Sondheim said, every show must have a surprise. Simple as that. Remember that. Utah Phillips had a great quote. He said, in folk music, you can't make a killing, but you can make a living. And that's a big difference. If your idea of success is Madonna and Lady Gaga, you're going to be disappointed your whole life. But if your idea of success is supporting yourself, doing what you love, you're going to have a great time. Grit Laskin is a fabulous luthier, and he also runs Borealis Records in Canada. And he's also a wonderful songwriter, and he makes dinner for his wife every night. He is the perfect man who makes it hard for regular guys. But <laughs> I asked Grit, I said, what advice would you give about guitars? And he said, get the best guitar you can possibly afford, and don't stint on guitar cases. The price of his guitars, and they're very pricey, includes a first-rate hard shell case. He will not sell his guitar without it. If you're traveling, you really have to invest in a good case. I foolishly took one of Grit's guitars in a gig bag, and it was $800 to repair it. And always have backup gear with you, because things are going to break. It's not if they break, but when they break. So always have strings, batteries, quarter-inch cords, tuners, band-aids, everything. Maybe you won't need them, but you'll find another musician who will. And Joining forces is a really smart thing to do. I got this idea the first time I went to Canada to play one of their festivals. They have the most wonderful network of Canadian festivals, Winnipeg, Vancouver, Mariposa. I even played Toronto Island when they had a festival there. And I saw how hard it is to be a single person with a little guitar when they've got these big stages and 25,000 people. That's what they have at Winnipeg. So that's when um, Four Bitch and Babes, became a, a thing that I did for eight years, and On a Winter's Night actually preceded it. And that was, I'll never forget, the first time I ever did an On a Winter's Night show was with Buskin and Bateau. Sophie Buskin is here at the festival, at, the, at NERFA. And um, I had a song that wasn't on a record yet. It was called The Kind of Love You Never Recover From. And I sang it. Oh, thank you. I sang it, and I said, if you like it, it's on this cassette, because On a Winter's Night was just a cassette at that time. I said, and you'll hear, at the time there were 22 people on it, you'll hear 21 other artists. I sold 300 that night. And uh, so I knew that, that doing these group things was a smart business move, too, because when you sell a compilation with you on it and other people who are in the show, but they're going to get to hear maybe 10 or 12 or 15 other people that they'll become fans of, that it just has this nice ripple effect, and we all benefit. Mm. Let's see. You know, people have so many different things they can do for entertainment. They can watch television, they can watch Netflix, and we have to make performances really special and give, it, give people a reason why they're going to come out and, and how it's going to really affect their lives. And one of the great things to do is to have a local scene. And if you have an open mic in your town, become a regular. If there is no open mic, start one. Don White, in the little town of Lynn, Massachusetts, just north of Boston, he started two open mics that have been going now for 10 years. Wednesday night is spoken word, Sunday, is all kinds of music, spoken word, anything. If you're ever in the Boston area traveling on a Sunday night, go to the Walnut Street Cafe. This, the mayor of Lynn was so impressed with Don, and he's a very self-effacing guy, and that they gave him the key to the city. They did, because of his, his two open mics. Jack Hardy had the songwriter's dinner on Monday nights in New York, and you could not come to the dinner unless you had a new song to play. And yes, sometimes people would pretend a song was new and we knew it wasn't, and they'd get thrown out. <laughs> That's a really great rule. But whatever you, whenever you have it, any kind of an open mic, you have to do it consistently, like every Monday or the first Tuesday of every month or the last Friday, always in the same place, never vary from it. Let the people in your community know, it'll take months for it to really you know, sink in, that there is a place where songwriters are valued. And so much will come out of it. 
sometimes romance. <laughs> That's always nice. And, um, <laughs> but friendships and collaborations. So if you don't have an open mic where you are, really start with it. It could be in your living room. You don't even have to make it a club. I've lived in New York for many years. I'm not living there now because I'm helping to take care of my mom. And, uh, but for 13 years, I went to cast party. Jim Caruso is the host, Billy Stritch is the pianist, Steve Doyle on bass, and Daniel Glass on drums. And it's different from any other open mic because you sign up at 9.30, you only get to do one song, and you don't know when you are going on. So you sit there with your instrument, trying to keep it in tune, and you sweat, and you wait for your name to be called, and when it's called, you hit the ground running, you can work with the band or not, whatever you want, do your one song, get back into the audience, and it really is a great exercise in discipline. You will lose your stage nerves. If uh, 13 years I did this, so I'm, I'm never nervous now before I have to do even just one song at a show because I know what that's all about. And for people who think, people who play open mics are not serious musicians, Billy Stritch, who's been playing this open mic for 13 years, he just got a gig. He is now the full-time accompanist for Tony Bennett. Yeah, from an open mic to Tony Bennett. That's... <laughs> Pretty great, but really keep it in mind, if you're ever in New York on a Monday night, come to Birdland, the food is great. You pay to, to go into the club, even the musicians pay. It's worth every penny. I know a girl who sang, Michael Feinstein was in the audience at night and he hired her to sing back up for him at Carnegie Hall from going to open mic. So great, great things can happen. And I wanna tell you a story. If you are in your town and you're not working that night and there is a show going on, you gotta go. You're gonna learn something. If, even if this performer is terrible, you learn, well, thank God I'm not him. Or, <laughs> but I wanna tell you a story about this guy, Gary Novikoff. He has a song called Dog on the Moon, and I have a song called If We Had No Moon. It was on a, a compilation put out by a space organization. And there's a guy named Bob Sherman in New York. He's been hosting a radio show for 48 years called Woody's Children. He considers all of us to be the, the children of Woody Guthrie, which is very sweet. And over, he's the first one who ever played me on the radio, ever. And for you people who've been on the radio, you know how exciting it is to see it coming out of the radio. And if it hasn't happened for you, it will, and it's a great feeling. I got into the habit of sending him people who'd never been on the radio, and I sent him Gary's song, Dog on the Moon, and not only does Bob play it on the radio, he writes to you and tells you when it's gonna air, so you could have a listening party of your friends staring at a radio. <laughs> so, I was in one of his shows. It was one of his anniversary shows. It was an amazing lineup. It was Pete Seeger, Tom Paxton, Tom Chapin, Work of the Weavers, it was, uh, uh, Odetta and Oscar Brand. But at the very last minute, Odetta and Oscar Brand, who, God rest their souls, they're not here anymore, they both came down with the flu. But it was round robin, so we knew there would be no problem with that. So the first half of the show, we all traded off songs, and it was, it was really great. And during intermission, I went out, I was just saying hello to people, and I saw Gary Novikoff, and I got this idea. And I said to Bob, I, I, I said to Gary first, I said, Gary, if Bob Sherman would agree to it, could you come up and sing Dog on the Moon because Odetta and Oscar Brander no shows? And I saw this brief look of panic flash through his eyes. And then he said, yes, I can. So I ran backstage and said, Bob, remember Gary Novikov, Dog on the Moon? He's in the audience. You're still the only person who's ever played him. What do you think of the idea of bringing him up to do the song since Odetta and Oscar Brand are, you know, aren't here? And Bob thought for a second, he goes, yeah. Let's do it. So we go out for the second half of the show. Bob tells the story and he goes, Gary Novikov, come on, come on, Daniel. So Gary runs down, because he's in the last row. And he jumped up on stage and he sat at the, the grand piano and he just, it was like grand slam. He knocked it out of the park. With, he had like five minutes notice this was gonna happen. And after the song, the crowd was going wild and he ran back to his seat. And it, it even gets better at the end of the show when we were all doing something together, I think it was Good Night Irene, something like that, Pete Seeger himself said, where's that Gary Novikoff guy? Let's uh, join, come on Gary, join us for the finale. So he got to run down the, the aisle again and he's on stage with Pete Seeger. I mean, can you imagine what, what an experience it was for this guy? So afterwards, we go out to a bar in Columbus Avenue with him and some of his friends and he said to me, he said, 
did it ever occur to you what could have happened if I bombed? <laughs> and the, the truth is, it, it did. It did occur to me because I had never seen him perform live. I just knew this recording. And I said, I would not have proposed the idea if I thought that would happen. But I thought even if it did, it would be an interesting moment. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I knew the audience was really nice. Folk audiences are so supportive. So then he said something I will never, ever forget. He said, I wrote Dog on the Moon on guitar, but I play left-handed guitar. And when you asked me, I was thinking of all the guitars on stage, and there was no left-handed guitars, but there was a piano, and I've never played the song on piano, but I thought I could probably transpose it in my head as I play. <laughs> Can you, i like, I mean, it was Lincoln Center, what is children, microphones going to be on the radio, Pete Seeger, and he, Livingston Taylor said, woe is me if I sit in my dressing room my whole life and nobody ever knocks on my door, but woe is me if somebody knocks on the door and I'm not ready to answer it. Opportunity knocked on Gary Novikoff's door and he was ready to answer. So that is a concrete example about why you should always go to a show if you're not working that night. I'm not saying this could happen every time, but it certainly can't happen if you're not there. Now, come to a very serious part of the show. Hearing loss. Yes, we've all been blasted by feedback many more times than we'd like to admit. I'm gonna show you something. This is my audiogram. This is my right ear. This is my left ear. And there is, is a hearing loss doctor in the audience named Dr. Joe Montano. That's really his name. He gets the best tables in restaurants. And I would like to invite Joe to come up here and explain what's happened to my ears so it doesn't happen to yours. Joe Montano. So Christine did say to me that she was going to have this really big audiogram that she wanted me to describe. So this is it. This is the audiogram. So what I will tell you is that Christine has hearing loss in both the right and the left ears. And her hearing is pretty good for the lower pitches. So she hears the mmm pretty good. But when you get to the s and the sh, she's not so good. That's where her hearing loss really is. It's in the higher pitches. And the interesting thing about a hearing loss like this is that we don't even know we have it. We just go along, we have trouble listening in noisy environments, we go to a club, we can't hear the person next to us. And that's because the low pitches make us, they compensate for our hearing and we do a little bit better. But the minute we put any kind of background noise in, we cover the low pitches and that's where we break down. So I will just say to you that it's great to get your hearing checked. You're all in the music industry, and, and people are going to say to you, you're going to say, I'm a folk singer. No one's going to hurt my hearing, but I'm going to tell you one quick story. I was working in Manhattan. I got a phone call from the East Coast Rocker, which was a newspaper out of Asbury Park in the, in the days when uh, Pete Townsend was coming to New York, and he was going to uh, uh, reu uh, reunite with The Who, and they had, he has a, a, a significant hearing loss from playing the, the, uh, on, the, on stage. And so they asked me about Pete Townsend's hearing loss. And I said, listen, it's not rock and roll. Everybody says it's rock and roll that's going to you know, hurt your hearing. I said, if you listen to Mozart and it's too loud, you can get a hearing loss. So the newspaper came out and the headline was, Mozart causes hearing loss. <laughs> <laughs> so if you listen to folk music really loud, folk music causes hearing loss. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. I also have, uh, if, of course, because I'm the hearing guy, I also have like boxes of hearing protection that everybody can take, and so the next time you go to a loud gig, you can wear some hearing protection to protect your hearing. And tomorrow, I'm gonna be on the fifth floor in the club lounge between 9.30 and about 11.15, giving out hearing screenings for anybody who wants to just check to see what the hearing is like. All right, so maybe I'll see you tomorrow, thanks. <laughs> So Dr. Joe Montano is from the Cornell School of 
Medicine, New York Hospital. He's really one of the top, top guys, and he loves folk music. I met him at a show many years ago. I didn't even know he was a hearing doctor. I knew him as a folk music fan. So I hope you'll take advantage of having such an expert here uh, over the weekend. And let's see, there's one other thing that I wanted to, to mention. I'll just say it. We're about to enter into perhaps the most difficult political time in our country's history. As much as I am disappointed in the American people having elected a crude, vogel, racist buffoon as president, I know it will make what songwriters do more important than it's been for a really, really long time. And I'm gonna end with a song, I'm gonna end with a song that I wrote the end of July. And I have to say that I, I'm very surprised that I wrote the song. I didn't know, it, how I felt about it. I, I didn't know a song like this was needed, and we know that our gun laws are probably not going to change very soon. So. You don't know what is there in the hereafter. Buddha, Jesus, Allah. It's all a guess. They are guideposts to help us on our journey. Do I want this journey to continue? Yes. So do all your friends and your neighbors. If we don't understand the struggle you endure. If we somehow are insensitive, we're sorry. But don't pull us into your private war. And know that there are people who will help you. Don't be afraid to ask. They'll take your hand. We don't want to watch you throw your life away. If you think we do, you misunderstand. If you are determined to leave this world, if you can't live with the status quo, self-destruction's nothing but a dead end, not the way any of us want to go. Don't take anyone, please put down Oh my wayward soul, instead, take a deep breath. Think of your mother, your 
father, your sister, and your brother. Jackie Damsky, thank you so much.